Hi, and welcome to the next video in this series to better understand the atomic structure. So in the last video, we were looking at Schrodinger's equation. Schrodinger's equation. And we came across what was known as a wave function, which we did not describe. So we didn't say what it is, which we're going to do today. Rather, we saw why it exists. Now, the wave function, we, s we had used it to describe information about the particle, but more formally, it contains all dynamic information about the system it describes. So far, we have only looked at energy. So, so far, we only looked at the energy part of the wave function, but in reality we can look at other aspects or other pieces of information within the wave function using different operators. So by operating on the wave function we extract what we need. By using a specific operator for energy as was done in the Schrodinger's equation, we obtained an energy balance for the wave function. But we can also use another operator, such as the length operator, so multiplying the wave function times length, which will give you, as you would expect, a length. We will go into operators in greater detail later on. For now, we're just going to try and figure out what this wave function actually represents. So, today we're going to look at Born's interpretation of the wave function. So sometimes we do need to look at interpretations simply because it makes everything far easier. But I would like to say that there are different interpretations of what a wave function actually is. But this one's the most classically used one or taught one in university, so we're going to stick to this. So the Born interpretation treats the wave function. Which, dis which contains information about a particle as a probability amplitude. Probability amplitude. Now this by itself doesn't make much sense, but when you square the wave function, I will explain what this notation is shortly, it gives you the probability of finding a particle. So this square that we used over here is equivalent to psi star times psi. Now this star is the complex conjugate times psi itself. So this is a way of, well, not exactly, well, squaring complex numbers in case psi is a complex number or complex values. But if it's not, you can just write psi squared as you normally would. So psi squared represents the probability of finding a particle in some given space. And of course, you will have to define the space you are in. So if you're looking at space in one dimension, so psi squared times dx will give you the probability that you will find the particle that the psi is describing in that length dx. So the same thing can be extended to three dimensions. So psi squared times dx, dy, dz, which gives you the probability of finding a particle in a given volume. So now we're going to see why this psi squared times dx dy dz represents the probability of a particle and why Born gave his interpretation. So if you remember the single, single photon experiment, what we did was we took a photon, passed it through a double slit, it went through, and the detector observed single photons interacting with it. But eventually, after a long period of time, after you had gathered all the collisions, the pattern 
was shown to look like an interference pattern. So although it was single particles colliding, they did somehow show an interference pattern. Now this would can be explained using the probability hypothesis, well interpretation, where you're treating the wave function as the probability of finding a particle. Which means the particle doesn't really, you don't know where the particle is going to go, it's not determined. But if you apply the wave function to the space right here, this volume right here, and you calculate psi squared, which is the probability that you'll find the particle in this volume, and you apply this to each of these given, well, lengths going downwards, you're going to see that these regions are regions of high probability, where you were you were expecting a lot of particles to collide, so a high value of psi squared, and the gaps in between where there's no interference, low value of psi squared. So Born's interpretation sort of explains this experimental result that we observed. So we can safely say that if we can actually use it and move forward from this point. Now it's important to understand the restrictions that are placed when we do consider psi squared to be a probability distribution. The first restriction is that the total probability, probability of finding a particle must be equal to 1 because the particle does exist so it must be somewhere it cannot be nowhere and we represent this by taking the integral which is summation basically of psi squared which is the probability of finding a particle in a given volume so three integrals one for each dimension so that's a long x that's a long y that's a long z and the total integral from minus infinity to infinity for all of these which is over all space should be equal to 1 and we do know well through some people actually tried this integral that it doesn't necessarily equal 1 at all times so we have to apply a constant here which normalizes it so by normalizing the probability we make sure that this value always equals 1 okay now this is known as normalization it's fairly straightforward we just multiply it by something so that whatever we get equals 1 so if psi squared times dx dy z d side of this integral is too big we multiply it by something like 1 over k where k is some integer um, and the product of this will be should be equal to 1 and this also helps us find the value of n so if you take n to the other side you will if you know this value you will find n so on and so forth but this restriction of the total probability of being 1 can be used in a very smart way if our dimensions aren't infinity. So if you restrict a particle, so you take a particle and you put it, you restrict it in this space here. Let's say this is a cube. Let's say we have a gas particle, for example. And the particle is placed within the cube, like Schrodinger's cat was placed within the box. Now the total probability of finding the particle in the box should be equal to 1. So this is the probability that this particle exists in this box. Right? That should be equal to 1. That's very useful because now we're no longer dealing with infinities but we can actually place a particle inside a small region, confine it, and we will get different values for psi than you would expect if you place it just in to roam around freely. Now, apart from this, there are several other restrictions that Born came up with that actually came up by themselves, more or less. The next one is that psi must be continuous. Now, this is a relatively obvious one if you've done some differentiation. But that's because in Schrodinger's equation, we differentiate psi twice. I should specify double differentiable. We differentiate psi, so it needs to be differentiable because we do do that as a process. The next thing is psi cannot be infinity. 
at any point. Because if it is infinity at any point, then our normalization factor would have to be zero. And that doesn't make much sense because then your whole value is zero. And it's zero times infinity is also undefined. So there's that area. The next thing is that psi must be single valued. This means that psi squared only has one value in a given space at a given at a given point. So what we're essentially saying is that the particle cannot have two probabilities associated of existing in the same point, which doesn't make any sense. So this is fairly intuitive, as you would expect. And all of these restrictions result in size in the whole Schrodinger equation having very few solutions because you have so many restrictions on what the possible values of psi can be treating psi as a solution so these solutions are solutions to the energy balance which you would expect would give you some energy levels which we will actually look into further so you don't need to worry about it too much but the solutions of the Schrodinger equation are correlated to energy because they come from energy balance and if there are few that will mean that you won't observe something continuous rather you'll observe something discontinuous and this is a very good way to see how energy is quantized. So earlier we saw how Schrodinger's equation can be used to derive de Broglie's relationship. Now we're seeing that Schrodinger's equation, because of all these re restrictions through the interpretation, actually result in quantization of energy, which is fundamental to most of the experimental results we have seen so far. So yeah, we're going to so in the next video, we're going to look at Schrodinger's equation in more detail, and we're going to look at some operators and see what information actually is within the wave function, now that we know what it is.